February of 2008, I had gone to Nashville to look for a house with Daniel and my dad calls me and he said, Hey, he's like, I just want to tell you that I love you. I immediately called a neighbor and I said, you've got to get over to my house. My dad came down, let them in the house. My neighbor and his friend went up to his bedroom. He locked the bedroom and shot himself. It's hard to talk about losing William without mentioning losing my dad. If I hadn't experienced that, I would not have had the same reaction in losing a son. I can say the Lord's prepared my entire life and had me walk through things and lean in and get to a place of total surrender. All right, well, let's go there. Okay. Let's go to your other part of your story. Let's go to December 13th, 2015. You can start from the beginning because uh, I know you got a call just like we got a call. That morning, I think it was the morning of the 11th, I'd spent extra time in praying for God's will to be done. I'm like, whatever it is you have for me, Lord, just give me the strength to get through it and just total surrender. And so I went to work, two coworkers come to my door and I was like, I could tell by the look on their face and one of them said, something happened with William. He choked at lunch and he's not breathing. Brad had called me and said, Sage isn't breathing. And I jumped to the car and went to the home where Sage was. And I called a handful of my girlfriends and my parents. And I said, pray for Sage because he's not breathing. And I was so peaceful because I, I knew he was going to be gone when I, when I saw him. I just was washed over and like you said it yeah. wasn't sad mm -hmm. it was just this peaceful feeling mm -hmm. and maybe it's just a mother's intuition that we're, we are blessed with when we mm -hmm. carry a child and, and have a child but I don't hear i feel like you don't hear that that often no. though mm -mm. i think of it as such a gift yeah you know? or maybe it was our boys just right. saying i got your mama mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's like, gonna it be okay it's gonna be okay um, that next morning we woke up and still there was never any sign of brain activity. They said, you're going to meet with the what next, what's next guy, Tony. And he presents the option of organ donation. And it was the first time that there was like a glimmer of hope as we're in this hospital of like our son's back there on a ventilator. Like what happens now? How does this end? And um, I remember saying to the nurse, just like, take care of him as you wheel him down to the transplant. And the answered prayer of how this ends, Tony walked us through and he said, you know, we'll keep him alive for a few more days as we match the organs. And then the day of the transplant, we turn off the ventilator halfway through. And so we said goodbye that Monday morning and went home to a really empty house. So we came home and I remember one of the first things we're walking up and I see a basket of cards and goodies from my group of friends. And that's what we did whenever someone was walking through something, that's what we would do. We would write a bunch of cards for them to have for the next month for them to read and we'd do a care package and leave them. And we had done that for the last couple years with things with adoptions, infertility, cancer diagnoses. And it was my turn when I walked and saw that. I just thought, okay, it's my turn. My little high school crew, my best friend from high school came in and she came up to me and she said, I think we know where William's heart went. And I was like, what? And we pull up online and watch a news clip of a little 18 month old girl um, from the day before, waited 111 days for a heart. Her parents, Amy and Brian Martin, get interviewed and they just say, we are so grateful that someone in their darkest hour chose to give life to our little girl and we will honor their life for the rest of hers. 